Hello, my dear friends. Today we will read the diary of the German Gefreiter Karl Horn, who served in the 9th Company of the 35th Motorized Regiment of the 25th Motorized Division. His diary entries begin not long before the invasion of the Soviet Union. There, he describes heavy forest battles, constant confrontations with Red Army cavalry, and fighting with partisans. As we could see from his entries, he considers the entire population of the Soviet Union as partisans. This text reveals the cruelty of German soldiers towards the local population and captured Soviet soldiers. This attitude towards them caused the uncompromising struggle of the Soviet people against the German invaders. Well, let us now begin. June 8, 1941. Today we're marching for the second time. I expect that our first target will be the Russian border. Within a few days, we'll march through Russia into Iraq. The final preparations are underway. Trudell said goodbye this afternoon. After eight months in a private apartment, saying goodbye is pretty hard. But the hope of being together once the war is over prevails over everything. Especially the parting with Trudell. I'm still lucky to have such a person. June 13th. We are in Poland for three days, at Walisow. We'll move on in a few days. Seeing the Polish mob around here is disgusting. Yesterday I was sent to Lublin. I saw a lot of people along the way, in ragged clothes, hanging around idly. Three men are herding one cow in a village. Three men in a village graze one cow as if they had no work. And they are still surprised that they are poorly off. And a nation like that proposes a war to Great Germany. July 13, 1941 after passing through Zviahel and Zitomir, we are in Rodna for three days. Our company is still a guard company. We are far ahead of our 25th Division. Each day we are paid a visit by bombers. Many times you see several of them fall. The fact that the company has not yet had any casualties from bombing is a pure miracle. July 17th I went swimming at the lake last night with non-commissioned officer Grauer. We rode in a boat at dusk. Grauer, who was a wonderful singer, added a kind of solemnity to the evening with his voice. Being so far away from your homeland and hearing our German songs in solitude brings such a longing to you. And who else could I miss but Trudel? But the solemnity faded quickly. While we are putting on our clothes, one man came running with a shout, Hurry up! We're moving now! The Russians broke through eight kilometers away! They are coming at us! Because we guard the headquarters of the Army Corps, we are unfortunately not getting ready for battle. We are withdrawing about 12 kilometers to the southwest, so I'm on post right now, staying right in front of Kiev and observing for any Russians that may appear. I've been sitting in a magnificent wheat field at dusk for the last two hours. My thoughts constantly run about Trudel. July 23rd. Today we are shifted as guard and return again to the battalion. July 27th. The 9th Company is now subordinated directly to the regiment. In conjunction with the tanks, the 9th Company must storm a heavily fortified village, which is 8 kilometers away. At 1 p.m., five batteries fired on the village. In the meantime, we with our tanks move forward. A five-hour fight for the village breaks out. We suffered only minor casualties, showing our overwhelming superiority. We and 20 soldiers from the 2nd Platoon wiped out the regimental headquarters, which defended strongly and cunningly. At the same time, I killed the first Russian in close combat. My mortar killed several of them as well. July 30th. The fight is now over. Some had shown themselves on the negative side. The awarding of honors is now underway. Some men, who were truly warriors in the true sense of the word, were left without awards. Still, they found consolation in the fact that the matter was not about awarding, but about the fulfillment of their duty to their homeland. August 1st, 1941. We move further and further to the south. The direction for now is Odessa Black Sea. Here we are engaged in battle once, and then we were quickly moved to another location where we were defending and advancing. August 2nd. While we were moving forward, July 30th, we came under continuous attack by Russian planes, causing us about 20 men wounded. August 3rd. It rained all night, and we spent the whole night on the vehicles. We neutralized a Russian breakthrough yesterday. August 4th. We are in the Corps Reserve. There is finally a bit of peace again. August 5th. We are on guard duty instead of resting. We went last night to the railroad, where four long freight echelons stand. We have to guard them. August 10th. 
We have been holding the defenses for the fourth day already. There are no Russians, but planes fly over us in large groups. Our fighters might destroy them if only they were here. August 14th. There's no post now. The post car is blown up in the air. The other sacks of post have been destroyed by the Russians. They are now smoking our cigarettes. It's 5 p.m. The captured Russians are up to 50 years old. They are probably the last of Stalin's reservists. If the weather remains as it is, we could push forward unstopped. August 15th. There were letters handed out at the positions last night. There was nothing for me for a long time. It is now 9 o'clock, about 6 kilometers out, we left the positions and went to the vehicles. The Russian planes in considerable numbers raid us, drop bombs, make a circle and drop bombs again. It is not a good thing. It is good that they do not fly low, otherwise the losses could have been far greater. August 17th. The company guards the industrial district of Kravoy Rog to prevent sabotage. The civilians seem friendly, but very fake. August 19th. Within 24 hours, we have advanced 100 kilometers. Now I am a squad commander. Advancing yesterday, we approached the Dnieper. August 22nd. We have been at the Dnieper, near Zaporozhye, for four days. There are huge industrial buildings in front of us. At night, even the Russian trains are running, in spite of our artillery bombarding them aptly. The Russians are certainly still trying to get the stuff salvaged. From time to time, the Russian artillery shoots a harassing fire. We observe the operations over the Dnieper day and night. August 25th. The post has finally delivered. There are four letters from Trudel alone. Excellent. Now I'm sitting at the trench and reading. The rain is falling. August 29th. The Hungarians shifted us today. We must go on leave for a rest. It is time now, and besides, everyone is pretty much soiled. September 5th, 1941. Since our shift, we have been in the village of Petrokovskaya. It is a deprived village, nothing to take out. September 9th. We should be prepared. They say the Russians have crossed the Dnieper. We are at the former positions. We are heading again towards the front. We reach Neuendorf, a place inhabited by Germans. This is where we can make a temporary halt. Ahead, the Hungarians hold the positions. That seems not so bad already. The locals can speak German impeccably. They came here 150 years ago. September 12th. No more rest anymore. We must cross the Dnieper to the north to encircle Ukraine. We saw Italian troops on our way for the first time. September 13th. Many of my company comrades have gotten wound badges in the last few days. This was caused by the bombardments of the last few weeks. There are very few soldiers lying in the infirmary because the wounds were light. It was, however, good evidence to the company that we had already been under fire. September 20th. We have been on the offensive since the 18th. We sleep very little. During the day we are on the offensive. At night we are on guard. This is how all the days have been passing lately. There is no thinking about bathing, letters, receiving post, and things like that. On the 20th, the attack on Vidisk was very hard. George was shot in the heart and died. He was found only on the second cleanup of the woods. What he looked like. The Russian villains, after he was already dead, had cut off his tongue, pierced his face and nose, and also robbed him. Oh, poor George. I was fortunate myself. The platoon commander, my gunner and I had moved aside during the cleanup and attempted, beneath the cover of darkness, to get to the platoon through the burning village. We watched the civilians lock themselves in one house and wondered about why that was so. They mostly go straight to the Germans so that no harm could be done to them. But suddenly the gunner shouted, Attention! Hand grenade! And several grenades flew over our heads. It is only by some miracle that nothing bad happened to anyone. September 21st. There was a forest battle again. September 22nd. There was a forest battle. So far, the resistance is insignificant. September 23rd. We stayed at night in a ruined village. The second platoon slept in the same barn with two armed reds. It was only a short time ago that they noticed them, took them out, put them by the pit and executed them. From 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., they cleared the forest of any remaining Russians. There was barely anyone left in the forest. The ones who remained in the steppe thickets, as tall as a man, were all commissars or officers who had fled from Kiev. These ragged men let us approach at a distance of three to five meters, because it is hard to see them, and start shooting at us. A bullet might suddenly whistle over our heads, and we could sometimes see the gleam of a shot. 
September 24th. Today is a rest day. Tomorrow we march in the direction of Moscow. We are now completely under Guderian's command, not Kleist's. September 25th. While abandoning the village of Shelnia, we passed by 94 graves of our regiment's dead, an awfully large number of them. They are all buried in one row, alongside the road. George is lying nearby, one of the first ones. The moment I saw his grave, I felt very emotional. That's gone now. September 27th. Our advance has been interrupted. I suppose we ran into strong Russian units. We often get out of the vehicles and beat off Russian attacks. Most of the time, they are cavalrymen. September 28th. The weather's awful. It will be impossible to use the vehicles at all soon. September 30th. It rains all day. We are soaked to the bone and freezing. I'm lying in guard with my squad. All of a sudden, eight Russian heavy tanks showed up. I don't know if they recognized us or not. I shoot tracer bullets and go back to the position of the company by the shortest way. At night, we sleep in a peasant hut. Yet many of us couldn't sleep since we were on guard duty. The Russian cavalry reconnaissance patrols attempt to enter the village. In the early morning, we abandon it. We withdraw to the battalion. September 31st. We stand in guard again under heavy rain. Our battalion has moved forward 20 kilometers. Meanwhile, we had no heavy weapons. The tanks move in front of us for a long time. Moreover, the enemy artillery fires. The shells burst very close all around us. We are surrounded. The Reds realize that we are alone. They become more and more brash. We don't get any food either because our field kitchen is behind the lines being repaired. We are attached to another company's field kitchen. We have not much bread left. That evening, the cavalry attacks us from all sides. It's dark. All of a sudden, we get an order. The battalion must break through to the regiment. We are unable to take the vehicles with us. They can't move through the mud. We also can't get back to the vehicles to pick up anything we need. So, I and my squad make our way back. The company made its way over the mountain into the valley. The Red Cavalry fires on us from all sides. Thank God the Russian artillery fired on the battalion, which was far away from us. After a difficult march through the mud, we reached the regiment at 3 a.m. October 1st, 1941. We have nothing to eat today. The other units also lost their field kitchens. We entrench ourselves for defense for a few days. Then another division will replace us. We will leave for Germany. Those two battalions from the 119th Motorized Regiment also have to leave for the same reason. They have no more vehicles either. The Red Pilots have caused us a lot of problems since yesterday. October 2nd. We have not received our supplies yet. If Trudel would see me in the condition I am in now. About 60 Russians attacked us. The attack is beaten back. At 8 p.m., the 1st Battalion replaced us. We go back until the next day. October 3rd. We are here three hours. We have a rest. However, there is no rest. We just heard the command. Stand by! We move forward again. Our comrades swear terribly. October 4th. The defense line seems to be a little calmer. At least I could sleep tonight. Trudel is a lovely girl. The parcels arrive one by one. Now I'll have an excellent rest of the night. October 5th. At 2 a.m. this morning, there was an alert. We marched immediately to the position. The Russians broke through on the left and right. They were beaten back again. Next night, we have to be on guard if they come again. A night in an open position. I get a shiver at the mere recollection of it. I feel horribly pathetic. The position is transferred to the swamp. October 8th. We are replaced by cyclists. We're soaked to the skin. The way back is disgusting. The wind is icy. It freezes our ears. Thus, for two days, we go to the village of Romney. Then, a one-day rest. The thoughts of the homeland are silenced. We ride on bicycles, after our two motorized battalions. October 13th. Within three days, we pulled ourselves from Romney to Putiva. A real picture of these days would look ridiculous. We go up to our ankles in mud and slush. The way through France was never as hard for me as it is here. It is a day of rest. Our apartment is a peasant hut. There is no provision coming in. There is no letter either. Today, we cook a goose for ourselves, but such conditions. There is mud everywhere, but we got used to that long ago. October 21st. During three days, we stay in the village near Sevsk. The division is assembling in the area. The provisions are still not arriving. 
It is very difficult to carry out. Only the trucks are able to pass through for now. There is no field kitchen for ten days already. The food situation is as follows. We have one-third of a loaf of bread per day for each person. We get raw meat from the company every day. That's all. There is nothing additional to this. Occasionally, we could catch a goose still. October 23rd. We are attacked by lice. Many of the comrades had them before me. Now I suddenly have them. I caught seven of them in my shirt yesterday. At night, lying in peace, their movements give only agony. We are still six kilometers from Sepsk. October 26th. It's getting worse with rumors, and nothing could be concealed. The Russian winter gives fear to almost everyone. Even now, neither food nor letters are arriving. There are more and more lice. October 29th. None of the Russians now, civilian or otherwise, have the right to go from one village to another. We Germans are partly too kind-hearted. So often on our advance, we saw civilians we could identify at the first glance as soldiers. They wandered all alone, without guards, around the villages. A lot of German blood would be saved if they were captured or executed at that time. That conclusion has come only now. In our village yesterday, 50 of them were executed. Possibly, if the soldiers everywhere would act with such determination, the atrocities of the partisans would cease soon. For four weeks, we have not received any letters. November 2, 1941 Yesterday, I received three letters from Trudel. Yesterday, we should also have been decontaminated, but we were only able to have a warm bath. The lice were brought back with us. We can't even sleep because of them. November 6th we have covered 25 kilometers, the road to Oral. November 12th. We marched 18 kilometers today. There is a heavy wind with snow. The Russian winter comes slowly but surely. November 16th. Now we are about 20 kilometers from Oral. We can't enter Oral. It is heavily fortified. In Tula, the Russians appear to have broken through again. I can't say what is going to happen to us. There are many rumors. Well, what will be, will be. The Reds won't beat us. The Russian winter won't conquer us either. November 19th. We arrived in Orel. We are first of all looking for apartments. November 22nd. We continue our movement along the Oral Tula Road. Here we guard the railroad and bridges. December 1st, 1941. I got a lot of letters from Trudel. I feel very happy about it. December 9th. Up until yesterday, we were near Matensk guarding the railroad. Those were good days, except that it was a little cold, only 30 below zero. We sat in a freight train on the line for 24 hours and passed 100 kilometers in the direction to the division. Tomorrow we will cover another 50 kilometers by truck. Now we're still in the village of Volovo. December 10th. We marched 35 kilometers along the front. There are rumors roaming around again. The 29th Motorized Division suffers heavy losses and falls back past us. In the night, one battalion was seemingly caught off guard and completely wiped out with the commander. Today, just before we arrived, the quartermasters executed several partisans. December 12th. We are stationed about six kilometers from Bogoroditsk. The company prepares positions for the whole battalion. The main line of battle is here. For this purpose, I and three other soldiers were sent to find a tool. Three partisans were executed at the same time. They said that they had been released from prison and were running towards the front with an assignment against us. December 17th. The division moves away from the Don, to the main resistance line. The Russians are pushing us strongly. We haven't slept for four nights already. We spent the whole night at the position. Many comrades got frostbite on their feet. In daytime, we withdraw or remain at the position. The frost is bad. There are no supplies again for three days. On December 14th, the company was in combat guard. The Russians advanced heavily. We had to withdraw. The food and other stuff we had on our sleds was again captured by the Russians. Now we are eating nothing but unpeeled potatoes. December 20th. Only two times in 20 days we have received food. I suppose we will be replaced now. January 3rd, 1942. Since Christmas Eve, we have been occupying the defenses on the main line of contact. Now we're not pulling back anymore. The Russians have twice launched an offensive in our section, but unsuccessfully. It's 30 degrees below zero today. These days are awful. We have to build up positions on a daily basis. 
At night, I lay at least four to six hours at a position. The worst thing, however, is the combat guard posts. We have to stand every three days at night, in the freezing cold, for four hours each time. It was joyless Christmas and New Year's Day. January 8th. This night, when I and my squad were in combat guard on heavily mined ground, my machine gunner stepped on a mine. He was totally cut up by shrapnel and died immediately. It was a heavy loss for the squad. January 10th. We are replaced. We have 10 days of rest. January 14th. The rest is over. We replaced the 10th Motorized Division. January 19th. They expect too much. Too much. I, with my squad, stay in a snow pit every other night. All night long, there are no provisions. Sometimes we have nothing to eat for almost a whole day. January 23rd. The temperature is 40 degrees below zero again for a change. It was 43 degrees below zero yesterday. January 29th. This night there was an unsuccessful reconnaissance. I and my men were about 150 meters away from the Russians. We could hear them. They were digging trenches. All of a sudden the mines began to burst around us. We got seven wounded. January 31st. A strong wind knocks us off our feet. The paths and roads are covered with snow, so neither provisions nor letters is coming in. February 10th, 1942. Despite the hard days, we have commanders who make our lives even harder. Our platoon commander, newly promoted Lieutenant Vogt, is such a person. Throughout the day and night, he yells at everyone and shouts insults one after another. This is where the diary is interrupted. On January 23, 1942, during a violent battle near the village of Kritsovo, this diary was taken from a killed German soldier. It was sent for translation and research, as it was in such situations. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, and see you all again.